All right. Uh, so just, Sally gave me three to five minutes to talk about writing. We're going to talk about a couple of tips and tricks. Um, here I want to just kind of echo some key components of a successful manuscript. So just a couple of general tips, and I'm sure my colleagues will have several to add as well. Um, but I think one of the first things is to start early. I think sometimes we find writing to be intimidating and overwhelming, and that lands up us procrastinating it and putting it at the bottom of our to-do list, and then it never gets done. I would start writing right from the beginning. So start your manuscript as soon as you as you submitted your IRB proposal. Then you can put in your introduction, you can put in your methods, and you don't have to wait for your data analysis uh, to be complete before you actually start putting this all together. The other thing that I think is important is to remember that this is scientific writing, okay? So you want to be clear and succinct. Remember, the goal is to actually convey information, so keep it simple and to the point. Yeah. All right, the other thing, sorry, before we go on. Um, to be successful in anything, you need to make it a priority. So make sure that you're actually carving time out in your work day or your work week. Set aside it for writing. Put it on your calendar, whether it's a day a week, a half a day a week, maybe it's just 30 minutes once a day. Whatever it is, actually block it on your calendar and protect it like you would any other appointment. Otherwise, again, if you're waiting for that day when you have a couple hours to spare, that day's never going to come, right? All right, so your introduction. Um, so the introduction really should provide the reader with background information about the topic and why it's important. This is where you're going to put in that conceptual framework that we talked about, as well as your problem statement, or at least some description of the knowledge gap that exists. Ultimately, the final line of this part of the manuscript should include your research hypothesis and your study objective. All right, so moving on to the methods. So the purpose of the methods is really to tell the reader what you've done with enough detail that they could actually replicate your study. I want you to think of your methods section as sort of like your how-to guide. Um, so there's a couple of key components that you want to put in. So what's your study design? Um, who are your participants and how are they selected? Um, what instrument were you using? And if this is a new instrument you're developed, make sure that you actually put in some detail about the development pro process and the validity evidence gathered to support it. You also want to make sure that you include all your study, your, all the activities that go into your study protocol, as well as your data analysis. Okay, and your results are just your results, right? You want to clearly describe your study findings without any interpretation. Generally, you're going to start out with your sort of your general results, so things like the number of participants, any demographic data that you've collected, and then you'll move on to the results of your primary outcome and then any secondary outcomes. All right, your discussion. So the goal of your discussion should really be to interpret your data and uh, discuss the significance of your findings. This is where you want to probably first start out with a summary of your main findings. No data here, just a summary of what you found. Um, and then move into the interpretation and why it's important and its significance. You want to make sure that you've situ situated your results within the context of the current literature. So what are, what's different about what you found compared to what has been previously found? What's similar? Then you want to also think about some plausible explanations for your findings and make sure that at the end you include your limitations and you include these as completely and as honestly as possible and think about and discuss how these might have influenced your results. All right, then finally your conclusion. So the biggest thing here is to make sure that your conclusion actually follows directly from the data and clearly addresses your study hypothesis. I know this seems simple, but I can't tell you how many manuscripts that I've come across um, as a reviewer, a decision, age, uh, a decision editor, where this wasn't the case. So really, don't stray from the point. point. All right. Do you guys want to add any other tips that you have for successful writing? So, so for me, uh, one of the kind of biggest game changers that, that was helpful for me early on was just have, being conscious of writing the paper with the, with the abstract when I'm presenting it out. Um, I find that when you have to like reinvent the wheel and go back in time and say, okay, I have to research this out now and I have to rethought, think through what was the impetus for this and re-galvanize everyone together is really painful. So um, I have a big point kind of having that out right when you're doing a study. In fact, I actually have most of my paper written before I've even launched the study because you can write the intro, the methods. You can, write, you can actually write the intro, the methods, the discussion, and you can write results with asterisks for your data, and then you're just updating it based on how your hypothesis may have changed, but it's much easier to kind of plug and play while it's fresh in your mind than to have to go back and re rewrite from scratch. 
Yeah, I, I would echo that point. And in, in fact, when I'm mentoring people, I ask them, go ahead and start writing your paper. And they look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, no, really, you should know what your paper is going to look like. Maybe you don't get the results you think, but you have an assumption going into the process. And I think it's really valuable. And you got to make time for it. Like if you do not, if you're like me, if you don't put time in your schedule to do this, time will just go by. So try to hold yourself accountable and find people that will work with you. And sometimes it's helpful, um, when it, I don't really hear the group say this, is set up a group that writes together. You don't even have to write the same things, but you show up at the same time and everybody's going to work on it. If you have a question, you ask your colleagues and they say, no, Susan, that doesn't sound right. Why don't you say it like this? Oh, yeah, that's great. So, uh, you know, having a community and it, it makes you feel more responsible, at least does for me, um, to feel like you got to show up and do the work that you plan to do. Actually, sorry. I actually really like one thing that you put in there as well about the concept of that friendly fire, having someone else take a look at this. Um, and I'm very conscious about picking people who are outside my field. So if it's an ultrasound article, I, put, I pick the, the anti-ultrasound person, John. Um, <laughs> no, I pick the person who's like, I will pick the person who's that. If it's something that is going to be, if I'm trying to pitch something, on a topic, I pick someone from the outside because the person who's going to be reading or reviewing it, same thing for grant applications, is often not going to be the expert that we are. And what we take for granted, they may not understand. So making sure it makes sense to someone outside of our specialty and outside the vested interest. So the next topic is, you know, where should I publish? What journal should I submit my manuscript to? And um, I'd like to draw your attention to page 21 of the workbook. Um, and by the way, a big shout out to Teresa for putting together this workbook. She did a phenomenal job. Um, but you pulled it together. Thank you, Teresa. Um, when, it, when you think about publishing a manuscript, I think you really need to understand where does your manuscript fit um, within the different types of journals that exist. So I categorize them as kind of education journals, and they're in alphabetical order. They're not in any kind of priority about one better than another, just so you know. And um, there may be others that, did, that are not on this list, but general education journals, medical education journals, then emergency medicine journals that publish education content, and then subspecialty journals. So we have, you know, specialties in EMS, pediatrics, et cetera. So you can look at those journals. And then um, there's other outlets like MedEd Portal, Jet EM. Uh, so what you really need to do is think about what is your manuscript about? Who's going to be the audience? Is it general medical education, like anybody? that has medical students or graduate medical education learners is going to be interested. You have to make that differentiation. Um, and based on your topic and who you think the audience is will help direct you to various journals. In the bottom right-hand corner on this page, um, thank you, Teresa, for pointing out Jane. Don't forget that there is an opportunity where you can go to this website, Jane, which is journal author name estimator. So you can either put keywords, you can put a copy of your abstract, and you hit submit, and it'll look for journals that have published similar things. So you might get some ideas. If you don't know where to go, it's, it's not everything, but it's things that are in um, Medline, as well as open access um, journals that have been indexed. So those are places to start if you don't know where to start. But then I'd also say go to the journals, once you find those, and look at their author instructions. Look at some manuscripts there and say, oh yeah, mine's kind of like this. Or when you did your lit search before you started your project, where were things published about the topic that's similar to yours? So that gives you some ideas of where to start. I'm wondering if my colleagues up here have other ideas, but that's my suggestion. The other resource I'll just mention is the AAMC actually puts out an annotated bibliography of places that publish education scholarship. Um, and I think you can just search annotated bibliography. They last put it out in 2017. But that's another good resource that will tell you the journal, um, their, their intended audience, the type of work that they publish. So it's another great resource to take a look at. Great. 
All right, so I'm going to talk a couple of minutes about the editor's perspective, and I want my main take-home point to be that editors are normal people. It's like, you know, that column stars, they're just like us. Editors are just like all of y'all. Wow, I really, I must have, so I just moved to Richmond, Virginia, and I just yeah. said <laughs> all you all. I just said all you all, so I must really be, um, see, I'm a regular person too. Yeah. Acting, uh, um, so what does that look like for you guys? So put yourself in our shoes. What we really want as editors are, we want to be able to have a role in shaping the journal. We really want people to read what we're publishing, and we want to feel like, wow, we're really identifying and promoting um, this amazing work or key concepts that really need to get out there. So if you realize that editors are thinking this way, I feel like it demystifies the process and makes it a lot less intimidating. So we're not looking to meet some kind of invisible accept rate and like how can we hack, hack, hack. Um, you reject, reject, reject and then what's left? No, we really want to like seek out the, uh, these gold nuggets and promote them. Um, to that point, I guess I thought of another um, addition to what Susan was just saying is we're normal people. It's okay to email us. It's okay to email the journal if you have any questions about if your work is something that our, the journal would be interested in. I know it seems like a very intimidating um, sort of Wizard of Oz dynamic um, there, but um, it's completely fine to reach out. It's our job to maintain ethical boundaries, so that's probably a concern of authors in this situation, but um, uh, don't worry if you're acting inappropriately, we, we would you know, be responsible for shutting that down and that is rarely, rarely, rarely the case. Um, follow instructions, I just can't say that enough. I think each of the two prior of you touched on this as well, but make it easy for us to say yes. Um, put your most Myers-Briggs J-type person as the final reviewer or formatter or what someone was saying, like the green personality um, type. Um, and don't let us get distracted by feeling like we want to mentally um, fix that the sections are labeled incorrectly. Um, it just kind of, I know that this is a thing for me that I'm very neurotic about um, following directions, but you don't want it to subtly influence um, someone's opinion of your paper and it really increases your credibility um, subconsciously even if everything is formatted correctly. Um, and my last pearl would be um, around a revise and resubmit decision. You're going to talk a bit about flat out rejection and moving on, but revise and resubmit I think for most decision editors is really a good sign. I mean if you go back to putting yourself in our shoes, we don't want to go through the substantial work of working with an author to go back and do revisions and multiple iterations unless it's something we're really thinking we can get into good shape for publication. So please don't be de dejected, that's actually um, a good sign. Um, I would say Rarely I would use a revise and resubmit decision if I literally had no idea what they were trying to say or had done and I didn't feel like I even had enough information on the methods to make a decision one way or the other. But 95% of the time it's a sign that we're invested in the process and keep going. Great. I think that being okay to email is such a key piece of that. Um, the first time I emailed an editor, it was extremely intimidating to me. Um, I sent an email out to Dave Talon, and I said, I'm not really sure what the reviewers mean by this. These, these are two conflicting comments. And he sent this whole long like, response back. He's like, this, 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 and let's talk on the phone. And so here I am. I think I was a fellow at the time, and it's Dave Talon, a huge IDE researcher, and he's just chatting to me. He's like, well, here's what I do with this, and here's what I do with this, and it's a great paper, and this is what I want you to do with it. And having that conversation allowed me to have it really quickly respond back and get it accepted versus what would have been like 50 responses back and forth and possibly even have led to some frustration and maybe even rejecting it because on the other end of it, sometimes you get responses back, like as an editor I'll get responses back and I'm like, you didn't address the question. And it's probably because it wasn't a clear question to them. So having that conversation often allows you to have a much better understanding of what you're supposed to be addressing as opposed to kind of guessing. And, you know, again, I'll completely echo this is that any editor I've ever talk to and being an editor myself, I'm 100% receptive to emails and they've always been 100% receptive to emails from me, even when I was a resident. They want to help. Else? All right, so then that leads to the last one, which is kind of a hybrid of dealing with revisions and dealing with rejection. So um, I think Nicole's point is really 
important in that most of the time if you're getting a revise and resubmit, it's because there's a value in the paper. And there may be, need to be some substantial changes and maybe even some reanalysis, but they, we see the force between the trees and there's a value in it. So take that as a good sign. That being said, a lot of revising and resubmits, from, especially from some of the um, really kind of top tier journals, have a lot of comments. And I have, many times I've looked at this like, seriously, 12 pages of comments? Awesome. And so you look at it, you're like, I don't know when I'm going to do this. Oh, I, this is, a, you, you, you feed through it through and you're like, oh, these are good, these are good. This is stupid. And you focus on that one. You're like, I don't agree with that one. So the first thing I do is when I get revised and resubmitted, I look at it and say, okay, cool. And I put it in my inbox to do two days later. I give myself a one to two day cool off period. Because I'm best in my project. I'm like, how do you not see the value in this? How do you not see this? So I like, cool. Maybe like a day, T knows me, it's a day. <laughs> I, give it, I give it six hours, fine. No, um, no, but I give it a time to cool off and, and accept and then go refresh and say, okay, cool. So this is what it is. And then I, I kind of follow, um, and I mentioned this to one of the groups too, is there's an idea of early wins and having something that you can kind of easily win. So I'll go through and I'll pick the easiest ones first. Oh, I misspelled there instead of there. Great, it, you know, the copyright editor would have caught that anyways, but I can fix that, that's fine. So I do that one and I say, oh, the sentence worded appear poorly. Okay, I'm gonna do this one. And I start to get that momentum, like, okay, I can fix this, I can fix this, I can fix this, and lo and behold, there's maybe only four or five hard comments at the end. And then I look and I'm like, wow, I'm 96% done. It's just four left and I have the momentum. And I'm, much more, I'm in a much better mindset to address those comments because I, I just did 96% of them, even though they were easy. Um, I try to put myself in the reviewer's shoes because if they say something that I don't agree with, I'm like, that makes no sense. It's probably either because I'm too close to it and I'm not seeing it, or I didn't explain it well enough that it made sense to them. And that's on me. That's not on them. Right? Reviewers are trying to help your paper. So if you get a response and you're like, that makes no sense to me, sit back and say, well, why doesn't it make sense to me? Is it something that I didn't explain well? Is it something that maybe doesn't have the value? Um, I remember one of my early papers I had uh, submitted was ultrasound for chest tube confirmation. And the idea was, can I confirm chest tubes with ultrasound? And I thought that was so great, it's so cool. I, I put this paper together. We uh, submitted it to a, we submitted to a journal and we got flat rejected. We got desk rejected in two days. And I was like, there's only two studies on this one. We are the biggest and most randomized study out there. How is this not getting accepted? And um, so I went to my mentor at the time and I was talking to him and I said, hey, you know, hey John, um, not this John, different John, but I was like, hey John, um, you know, this paper got flat rejected and I don't understand why. He's like, well, I'm looking at this and I don't understand why it matters. And I realized that I didn't do a good job from the start of, of actually placing this in why does ultrasound for chest tube confirmation matter? So I rewrote and I said, okay, well, one to three percent of chest tubes are placed in the subcutaneous tissue incorrectly. X-ray is insufficient for this. CT is your gold standard, but we're not going to send every patient to CT. This is why this is important. And, and it's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. And the next paper got revised and resubmitted and got accepted in the second round but it's kind of being too close to it and, caring and not realizing that and understanding that kind of reviewer comment piece of it. Um, there are times where you're gonna get rejected. In fact, the odds are we should be getting rejected because if we're not getting rejected, we're not aiming high enough. If I, I, I have many times reflected back on papers that I have submitted to journals that did not have a great reach, a great impact. And at the time I said, oh, this is so great, I accept it. And I reflect back and I'm like, yeah, and this got buried in a journal that no one's gonna read. So I put all this work into there and really the goal of this is beyond impact factors is actually disseminating knowledge and change the effort you did and the patients and residents who contribute to these studies and then it goes somewhere where no one reads. So aim high, expect to be rejected, that's okay. That means you're aiming high enough and then incorporate those changes. There are, last time I checked, about 75 legitimate emergency medicine journals. Um, if you add in medical education and ultrasound and trauma and pediatrics, you can go into 150, 200 journal outlets. So you can keep going through it. I've gone through some, one of my most high, highest cited journals went through, or highest cited articles, went through eight journals before I find a home. Mm -hmm. And that got the highest cited, but it was, it, you have to kind of plow through because that means you're, you know, you're aiming high. I submitted to annals and it definitely should have gotten rejected. <laughs> that was way too high for it. But at the time I learned a lot through the process and I'm glad I went through that. And as I got more, you know, sophisticated, I started to target it down and tailor it there. But we should be getting rejected because that means we're aiming high and it's a good thing. Yeah, I think the key really is to be resilient. Don't let it bring you down. Learn from it uh, and move on. Um, for some people that's harder than others. But I think you got to be diligent and you got to be a good student. You got to learn what you could do better and differently and um, take that and move on to the next opportunity.
I guess that's easy for me to say sitting on this side of the table, but um, but I really mean it. It's it's hard, you know. No one wants to get a manuscript and see that it, you know, no one wanted to publish it first time around. But keep trying, or learn from whatever comments you get back. I like the phone call. Um, so if you see someone, you can ask them, get their input. You know who at least in emergency medicine, look and see who are the editors, you know, who are the decision editors, talk to them about it. Um, people, I, I've definitely had phone calls with people saying, I want to, you know, do an article on this, or what do you think about this idea? You know, I don't make promises, but I say, hmm, I'm not so sure we take that, or that sounds really interesting, did you think about that? So I think it's worth um, reaching out. The only other thing that I'll add, too, is just don't take it personally. Um, I think that's a big thing. I think we get so invested in our work, and then we see this rejection letter with a whole bunch of comments, in, and we just get very upset, and then we kind of put it off the way, and we ignore it for a while, and then we come back to it six months later. And it's a lot harder to revise things six months down the road. So I think take a couple days, maybe, maybe more than six hours, but take a couple days, <laughs> let the sort of emotions calm down for that rejection, and then take a good look at those reviewer comments. And then if there's things that make sense to you, make sense to you change them. I'm not advocating for you to completely completely abide by every reviewer's comments, but if it makes sense and you think it'll improve your study, make that revision and then resubmit quickly. I think, uh, sorry, two seconds, oh, okay. oh, I was going to say, um, the other thing that um, kind of plays off that is a lot of times it's the reviewer experts in your topic review for multiple journals, which means when you, when you get rejected from one, mm -hmm. the tendency is to say, well, fine, I'm rejected, I'm not going to respond to the comments, but then it's going to go to that same reviewer odds are in the other journal, mm -hmm. and they're going to know you didn't respond to their comments. And that will have a much worse outcome, even if you were right for that journal, than just responding to the com comments and kind of incorporating. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, responding to a comment doesn't mean that you have to agree. Yeah. You can discuss it and the keyword there is respectfully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, you could even turn it back into a dialogue too. Like we could handle this one of two ways. Which do you yeah. recommend? I mean, again, going back to the, it can be a back and forth dialogue. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great point. And frequently they're the same reviewer group. Sometimes, I mean, I've noticed that with academic emergency medicine education training because the reviewers review for all the different journals and they're like, I saw this somewhere else, you know, <laughs> so it's a small community.
One final corollary plug is if you're not already, I highly, highly recommend everybody that is wanting to write papers, volunteer to be a um, peer reviewer for a journal. You learn so much about your own writing and what's going on in the world of publishing.